Uh, as an entree to uh, Dr. Singman's talk, I, I just wanted to ask uh, Helen Ikuchia to say a few words about her ophthalmologic issues and uh, a, a few brief words about Ellen. Uh, she was near top of her class, college athlete. Uh, she did a master's in human development issues, uh, was involved in some major startup companies, uh, and then handpicked by Bob Muller to be a senior level person at the FBI. She was the youngest uh, person ever selected for a senior level position in the FBI. And uh, she's an amazing, uh, truly amazing person. And so, Ellen, if you'd say a few words. Um, hello, good evening. A lot of you have seen me behind the podium before talking about my experiences, um, the fact that I've had the Chiari malformation, I've had the tether cord, I've had a lot of those surgeries. And I've also had um, an LP shunt that was placed that helped control the intracranial pressure, or so we thought. Um, last fall, we started to have a series of problems occurring again, and we really couldn't figure out what seemed to be the problem. It started with just you know a couple of headaches here or there, nothing really significant compared to what we all know as headaches. Um, but I also started to have pressure around my eye socket and primarily pressure that was right above my eye, sort of like at the 11 o'clock mark. And it felt like somebody was putting a, a fishing hook or fishing lure down behind my eye. And so that pressure and pain was very tremendous. And over the course of just four days, I went from having that tremendous pressure behind the eye to having a situation at night where my eyes seemed somewhat blurred, to um, a late night Thursday night call saying, I can't see uh, that eye anymore. All I was able to see was a distant shape um, and losing that vision. So very, very quickly, we'd move from a situation of, well, it's you know probably a typical Chiari kind of scenario to having problems where I could not focus um, out of the left eye, and slowly the right eye was moving in that direction, although fortunately I could still read out of that eye and, and see. So I think the video that, um, that we just saw a few minutes ago is actually a very good t transition and tie. And so many of you know that our, um, our history in trying to find the right position and the right position team is not the easiest thing in the world. And trying to find the right physicians who know exactly our story and how to help us is also a very difficult um, climb. And so interestingly enough, we've, we have you know Dr. Henderson who's done a tremendous job of being the leader of our team medically, and I see Dr. Frank Amanos back there, hello, um, helping us as well. But at the time, I didn't have anyone on the team who was really looking at my ophthalmologic issues related to my intracranial pressure. You know, so many of us wear glasses and we just go and think, oh, we need to get our eyes examined every year or two and get maybe a new pair of prescription lenses. When this came down, push came to shove, and Dr. Frank Amano had recommended that I went up to the Wilmer Eye Clinic I was um, very blessed that day to have um, our next guest speaker, who I'll, I know Dr. Henderson will introduce, but he was on staff that particular day when I walked in, um, not being able to see out of the eye and continued uh, pressure. So I, I was overwhelmed, as I know many of you would be, when I started talking and he said, and I said, I have EDS and Chiari. And I know you've, you've all probably had the same experience I did, which is a doctor says, yeah, yeah, I know about Chiari, yeah, yeah, I know about EDS. But he then precipitated to go on and explain to my husband and I about EDS and Chiari, and I thought, wow, God's really looking out for me today because um, I've run across a physician in my time of dire need who really knows about EDS and Chiari. So um, with that in mind, I'm sure he'll be talking about um, what he uh, saw and um, his experience in this area. But we went right back to Dr. Henderson and Dr. Henderson went right in and did um, another shunt revision for me to pull some of that pressure off my brain and was able to restore my eyesight pretty quickly. So 
Uh, I gave Ellen all of uh, five minutes to prepare her <laughs> remarks this evening. Uh, I, I am so excited to have Dr. Singman here this evening. We are truly blessed. Um, uh, uh, Eric Singman is the director of the General Eye Clinic at Johns Hopkins <coughs> University. He did his baccalaureate in chemistry in Brooklyn, uh, where he won the uh, coveted Jonas Salk Prize. He received an MD PhD at SUNY. Uh, pediatrics at Brookdale. He did ophthalmology at SUNY, then neuro ophthalmology at Kingsbrook Jewish Hospital. He was then in private practice for 12 years in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Also taught at Sinai in Baltimore, and has become increasingly involved in the neuroscience of head injury and the ophthalmologic issues uh, as regards uh, head injury. And. Uh, He's, uh, he then moved to Hopkins, where he's director of the Wilmer High Institute General Eye Clinic. And uh, amazingly, he has a real interest in the EDS, and I think he's going to make some uh, spectacular findings in that area. He's going to talk about the association between hypercoagulability and EDS and pseudotumor. So, Dr. Singer. I hope that's um, sufficiently legible to you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it was actually my privilege um, to be asked to come here. That's a thrill. Um, about 15 years ago, I gave a talk to the Spina Bifida Association in Lancaster County. And at that time, I, had, I was very excited to be able to tell them that finally Lancaster General Hospital I stopped using latex gloves, which led to a, a terrible problem, obviously, in those patients. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to make some sort of announcement about that, uh, some sort of warning, at least, that hospitals are going to recognize that fluoroquinolones can cause a tendinopathy, and in patients with EDS and Marfans, maybe that's not such a great idea. Um, but that time will tell, and that research is only coming out about that now. And, in fact, only in 2012, the first reported case of a hip tendinopathy from fluoroquinolones has come out. Um, so we're really in the infant stage of understanding what's going on there. They're good drugs, just not for everybody. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about pseudotumor cerebri, Chiari, sticky blood, because say, saying hypercoagulable states can hurt, and LSD <laughs> I made this graphic all by myself. <laughs> it probably looks like my kid's science project, um, but I try to avoid copyright issues. Um, so vision problems are associated with a lot of diseases. You name it, there's probably a vision problem there. One of the fun things about neuro-ophthalmology, if you can call it fun, is that um, we try to be systemic ophthalmologists. We try to say, hey, okay, you have this problem where you're taking this therapy. Is your vision an issue at all? And when I say vision, I don't just mean clarity. We'll talk about more. I mean anything related to what your eyes do for you and what you do with your eyes. So the reality is, guess what? They really are all pretty much connected. And I think I'll show you some examples of how that might be the case. First, we'll start with pseudotumor cerebri. Pseudotumor cerebri is elevated fluid pressure in the brain. Pseudo means fake, and tumor means tumor, mass, and cerebri is brain. And pseudotumor cerebri means elevated fluid pressure in the brain. We don't know why. Now, there are many conditions that cause elevated fluid pressure in the brain. When we find out why, then we don't call it pseudotumor cerebri anymore, we call it elevated fluid pressure in the brain from this. But until we find out why, we call it pseudotumor cerebri. For example, uh, the most common person to get pseudotumor cerebri might be a gal in her childbearing years who has significant obesity. And you say, wait, that sounds a lot like a ehlers chiari animal. Guess what? We'll, we'll see. That's true. These patients can come to see me and they can have a swollen optic nerve because the optic nerves are direct extensions of the brain. And when I look in the eye, I see a, this picture. And when I see that picture, I freak 
and I say let's get an MRI and do something quickly. Um, often these patients are chatting and happy and talking. They don't have to have headache. They don't have to have blurred vision when they bend over, but they often do. These patients also have visual field effects. This is a picture of a visual field printout. Those large black spots are where your natural blind spot should be. We all have a natural blind spot. Our optic nerve has no photoreceptors on it, so it shouldn't see light. You could shine a laser there and you wouldn't see it. But these patients, because the optic nerve is swollen, the blind spot gets bigger. These patients also get blurred vision. They, they don't see as well. It turns out that the vision can also get dim and less colorful. And one of the tests we used to suit as Tim Cerebrae is we say, bend down to tie your shoes, and if you're wearing red sneakers, they might look a little less red, or they might be a little dimmer. These patients also have horrific glare. We don't know why that is, but these patients are desperately struggling with glare frequently. They try wearing sunglasses, goodness tells you. It's, it's just not gonna work for them. These patients have issues with that. These patients can see double. Uh, frank double vision, not just a blurred image, but actually they will see double because the elevated pressure in the brain can affect the nerves that move the eye muscles. And if those eye muscles aren't working as a team, then the eyes are going to point in different directions. And when they point in different directions, you see double. These patients also can get nystagmus. The reason I have this picture here is because usually I take the metro in Baltimore to work and I try to do some reading on the train and it's on a jiggling object and you can imagine how well that's like nystagmus for somebody who's not on a moving train and they're just trying to read and they can't see because their eyes are jiggling nystagmus usually suggests that there may be some cerebellar involvement a cerebellum is a part of the brain that's involved in your balance and, your dizz and if it gets bad dizziness and these patients can have that problem patients can come in with any one of these they can come in with headaches that are so bad that they can't open their eyes if your eyes are closed, that affects your vision, I guess, too. <laughs> Chiari vision. Oh, please refer to the previous slide. <laughs> guess what? They look an awful lot alike. There are some subtleties. For example, not only might a Chiari patient have a visual field reduction because they have swollen optic nerves, but you ever see a Chiari patient try to turn their neck? They don't do so good. Um, and so that functionally limits their peripheral vision. I was sitting next to somebody and she didn't notice me and I, even though I'm very, very thin, um, <laughs> okay, maybe not so much. But, but she didn't notice me and, and, and I, I'm not wearing camo. It's because you, you have to be able to kind of turn and see that person. And PR patients have big problems with that. So they actually have a lot of functional deficits uh, therein. But the, the, the similarities are striking. I sometimes ask myself, PTC and Chiari, are they maybe two sides of the same coin? Are they maybe, maybe there's a chicken and egg situation here? Is it one lead to the other? And I'll show you some interesting evidence from recent publications that maybe they should think about that. Here's the factoid portion of our talk. In one study, 24% of patients with PTC had inferior tonsillar displacement. Now, just those of you who may not be familiar, the cerebellum has two little extensions on the side called the cerebellar tonsils. These are not the tonsils you get when you're sick as a kid and your mom gives you ice cream and you get surgery. These are cerebellar tonsils. These are parts of the brain that start to hang down below the foramen magnum, which is the large hole at the base of your skull. And your brain's not supposed to go down below your skull. It's good when your brain is in your skull, where it belongs. Um, and, the, and so these patients get cerebellar tonsil displacement. Um, patients with Chiari, uh, patients with uh, pseudotumor cerebral, when you look at their MRI, often have small ventricles as well, and they often have something called an empty cell, which is the, the cell of Tersigo, which means the Turkish saddle, is a part of your brain in which your pituitary sits. And they get, the pituitary gets flattened, and so this extra space there filled with fluid that's called the empty cella, and patients with Chiari seem to get those same MRI findings. It's, you know, remember the, when you were a kid, now you put on something maybe too young, but there was a coin you had, amazing coincidence between Lincoln and Kennedy. And they had all these different things, like Kennedy had a, had a secretary named Lincoln, and Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy, and I'm starting to think like PTC and Chiari, because they can move the car, <laughs> we can send that to patients like that. 42% of Chiari patients who did not improve with decompression 
most of them responded to some extent with lowering the intracranial pressure, suggesting that in a lot of patients with Chiari, intracranial pressure is a big problem. And so all of a sudden, it's, it, the lines between these two conditions are getting a little blurry. Acquired Chiari can be a late effect of shunting surgery for pseudotumor cerebrate, especially Chiari 1. So you've lowered the pressure, everything's hunky-dory, and all of a sudden you do the MRI and the tonsils are now down. Wait, 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 they're supposed to, okay. Head trauma has been reported to lead to both symptomatic Chiari and PTC. One of my first pseudotumor cerebrate patients was a young gal who was five foot something and her husband was about six foot something and he lowered the hatch of the minivan and she, he didn't see her standing there and it went straight down. She ended up with pretty bad headaches and came to me and she had normal looking optic nerves but her headaches were very concerning for elevated pressure. So after neurologist said no, 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 it, we took a pressure and it was through the roof and so you kind of elevated pressure without having swollen optic nerves. It's called pseudotumor cerebri sine papilledema, which means without papilledema. Papilledema is swelling of the nerves. At any rate, she was shunted, and they finally had a lower pressure down to like 30 millimeters. Um, just some people need low pressures. Upon further history, her daughter had morphine. She didn't, but her daughter had morphine. So you, in, the, in the tape that was played before, that wonderful tape by the CSF, Foundation, you talk about can you get can you give it to your kids? Well, apparently, your kids can give it to you. Um, <laughs> at any rate, it's they're, they're probably you know it would not surprise anyone to think that there's genetic predisposition to any of it. Um, the other thing is that one of the amazing things that we can see is that in a pseudotumor cerebri patient where you lower the pressure. I remember one year in Nanos, the North American Neuroophthalmology Society has an annual meeting and they have abstracts and posters and presentations and one of them was a patient with pseudotumor cerebri who had like something like 8 to 11 millimeters of cerebellar tonsil descent. I mean from our perspective you look at an MRI the tonsils are tickling the toes here and they lowered the pressure and within 36 to 48 hours the tonsils completely receded back above the frame of magnum. So this is a very fluid no pun intended, very fluid situation in which the brain actually has a lot of movement. For those of you who don't know, the brain actually floats on this CSF. The brain is made of mostly fatty materials. It actually floats in your skull. One of the reasons I got involved in this area was because I'm involved a lot in traumatic brain injury. So when someone has an accident that's a lot milder than you might think, the brain sloshes around inside the skull and that can cause a lot of problems. We're now going to talk, switch gears a little bit about hypercoagulable states. Let's call it sticky blood. This is my favorite slide. Our first hypercoagulable state. Uh, for those of you who didn't get that, that's Alaska State. Get it? All right, fine. Thank you. This is the best humor you get on neurophilmologist, by the way. You don't get it. When our blood flows through our bodies, it's really good that it flows and doesn't clog up. Because if it clogs up, then that's dead. Um, what keeps the blood flowing are very important chemicals that keep the blood flowing. And what keeps the blood clotting, let's say someone goes off and gets a cut, are important clotting chemicals whose job it is to want to make the blood clot. And these chemicals are constantly fighting each other. And if they're not in balance, then someone got from can bleed to death, that's called hemophilia, or if they're not in balance, someone can start clogging up on the inside. Factor V is one of those clotting factors in the coagulation cascade. And there's a mutation called the Leiden mutation, which prevents one of the anti-clotting factors, protein C, from working well. That's called protein C resistance. This is one of the inborn or genetic causes of hypercoagulability. There are others. For example, there's the prothrombin, which is another Florida python. I was going to put a giant python in. The prothrombin is another anticlotting factor. Um, and it's, there's a gene mutation where uh, guanosine is changed to adenosine. This is at the level of DNA, so one of the bases is changed, one of the DNA acids is based from one to another. 
and so it doesn't work so good. Another one is homocysteine. This often comes when a cytosine is changed to a thymosine at the at position 677. That's what those numbers mean, by the way. Um, in methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. Now, all of you, I'm gonna test you on that enzyme name, <laughs> but that particular enzyme helps convert homocysteine, which is an amino acid, to a different one that you can get rid of. When you can't get rid of homocysteine, uh, it builds up and it can cause stroke. So again, these are some of the genetic causes of hypercoagulability. Then there are deficiencies. For some reason, patients don't make enough of those anti-clotting factors, protein C, protein S, and antithrombin. Uh, it's not any more common in Idaho, but that was a state that fit these words, so I know. Did anyone of you not know that was Idaho? Because my kid had to learn the 50 states. I don't know the 50 states. I never really learned the 50 states. So I, but I had a test on the 50 states. Fortunately, I had the book. Um, and then there are the acquired um, high, high, sticky blood syndromes. <laughs> and these ones are often antibodies. Your, all, all of our bodies make antibodies. Antibodies are protein that are really, really important because they kill germs. And we need them or we wouldn't be here. Uh, however, sometimes the body makes antibodies you don't need. For example, lupus is a situation that no one really needs. Um, and your body, in patients who have lupus can make antibodies. Uh, that's called, uh, other conditions are called antiphospholipid syndromes, and they make antibodies called anticardiolytin, lytin bearing antithrombo, antithrombin three antibody. They can make something called beta two glycoprotein blocking antibody. All these are part of the antiphospholipid syndromes that we can see with lupus and lupus-like diseases. These patients had no clotting problem until they started making these antibodies. Then they had a problem. And these conditions can present in a myriad of ways. Now when we talk about someone with sticky blood and their vision, that's where it gets kind of interesting and that's when I see these patients. First, if the sticky blood is on the vein side, they can get a central retinal vein occlusion. They'll come in saying, I have no pain, your eye looks quiet, I just don't, they might even say I don't see too badly, just I notice a difference. And you look in and you see a pizza pie and it's a pretty dramatic finding. If you start seeing a lot of these little white areas on that too, then it means the, the, there's a, actually a bigger problem that you're starting to lose vision um, from ischemia, loss of blood flow in the retina, and that patient has a bigger problem than someone who just has the hemorrhages. They can also come in with an ischemic optic neuropathy. This is a condition which simply describes what you're finding. They come in, again, painless. I feel fine. I, can't see below where I'm looking or above where I'm looking in one eye. And they'll come in and they'll see a swollen optic nerve with some hemorrhages off the nerve. It has sort of a pallor, or what we call a waxy pallor. And these patients, unfortunately, can get this in the other eye a reasonably good percentage of the time. This is the condition you might have read about when you read the ads in the back of Money Magazine for Viagra. Um, because that's what they say, if you notice vision problems, run to your doctor. I was one of the um, principal investigators for the Viagra trials for um, Pfizer, looking to see if there was truly an association. Um, we had a reason why we patients who had used Viagra the night before woke up and I asked them, was it worth it? And generally <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> Um, one guy though said, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he got about 78 and died with his boots on. So. Um, these patients can also have a thrombosis of the veins that drain the eye. You should know that your brain doesn't have veins. It has these large spaces called venous sinuses. These are not the sinuses in our noses that we breathe and then we get stuffed up when we have a cold. These are large blood-filled areas that are lined with vein-like tissue, but they're open. And the, the uh, sinuses, such as the cavernous sinus, the cold looks like a cavernous, um, a lot of the ophthalmic structures run through. And when a patient gets a venous sinus thrombosis, uh, the blood doesn't have a place to drain. The eye gets swollen. They come in pretty dramatically. Um, they come in, they, you'll see this, if you look at this gentleman, he looks like he's looking up, but the other eye is looking at you. The eye doesn't move right, the eye doesn't feel right, the eye doesn't close right. 
Um, the eye may not have a lot of pain because the nerves that feel pain are also affected. This is a picture of uh, MRV, magnetic resonance venogram, and it shows you a significant asymmetry. And that's because um, the L-shaped structure that you see coming off, to, I guess that would be to your left, there's not one going off to your right. And that's because it's clogged. And that's called a venous sinus thrombosis. These are some of the venous sinuses. When that happens, the poop hits the fan because all of a sudden now, you can't drain your brain. The cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, little plug for the CSF Foundation, the cerebrospinal <laughs> fluid is produced and it's constantly drained, something called the arachnoid granulations, and it's drained and it's brought into, back into the venous system. If you can't drain it, but you're still making it, pressure's gotta go somewhere, and it squeezes the brain. So all of a sudden now, we see a connection between my hyperpumbal state and elevated fluid pressure in the brain from venous sinus thrombosis. So there's a connection right there. And that's an important connection because Unfortunately, there are other things that can cause venous sinus thrombosis. We don't know necessarily which came first, the chicken or the egg. We get a patient with pseudotumor cerebri, it was very high pressure in the brain, and we do one of these, and we see a narrowing of the venous sinus. And we do a workup and the blood's not real sticky. Is that because the pressure on the brain narrowed the venous sinus, which then led to further pressure on the brain? Or is that because the, the venous sinus was narrowed anyway because the tissues were a little bit schwach, a little bit weak, like in Ehlers Danlos or Marfan's or something, and so they're more compressible and one led to the other? I, I'm not gonna say, but we know that happens. Now we'll go to EDS and vision. I call it a fragile relationship. <laughs> so I was going to put Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton up there, but most I figured most people, who are they? You know, I know, they got married and divorced like three times. You know? but, but now this is our new Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. I called her Case too. At any rate, um, Ella's Danlos in the eye. So first, let's think fragility. If it can break, it does break in the eye. For example, these patients have conjunctiva that's very lax. The conjunctiva is the mucous membrane covering the eyeball, and it gets lax, and it can actually become conjunctivocolatic, which means that it gets so loose that it sits on the eyelid, where it doesn't get completely moistened when you sleep at night or doesn't get complete moistened during the day. And these patients come with these red irritated eyes that are constantly miserable and dry. And I promise you for those people, I know you don't, but I get, I speak to doctors, oh, it's only dry eye. It's only dry. I would like have dry eye for a day. <laughs> for, no, better have dry eye for 20 minutes and then tell me it's only dry eye. These patients also get very stretchy eyeballs. And when an eyeball gets stretchy, it gets long. And when it gets long, it gets very nearsighted. And that's a problem. I'm gonna see that in a second. Another problem these eyes get is that the lens, which is, helps you focus, it's a really important part of the body until you go to Florida where they take everyone's lens out. <laughs> um, if you have a pulse uh, or not. Um, but the lens is really an important part. It helps you focus things. Uh, but patients with Ellis Danlos and Marfans, and, and their lens falls off into their eye, partially or completely. That's called lens subluxation because the little tissues that are supposed to be strong and hold it, little tendon-like tissues, and they're not so strong. That goes throughout their whole body, as many of you know. The retina is supposed to stay on, but if it gets stretched in a long myopic eye or it just gets stretched because the tissues aren't so strong, it breaks and tears and leads to a retinal detachment. The arrows are pointing to the leading <coughs> edge of a retinal detachment that's threatening the macula. So this is a patient who we get their bottoms into the OR and we try to do something about this fairly quickly before the macula comes off the macula's area of best vision. These patients also can get something called angioid streaks. Angioid means like a blood vessel. 
they are, this is a poor picture of it, but they get little breaks and cracks in the choroid, which is the, when you look in, if you ever see someone with red eye, when you took a camera picture, that red is called the choroid, because the retina itself is colorless, it has nothing, it's just clear and colorless. And that choroid is a spongy layer of capillary-like cells. And that feeds your eye. Your eye is one of the most highly metabolic organs in your entire body, perhaps second only to the parathyroid gland, which is a board's question, by the way. You'll want to know that. <laughs> um, at any rate, so the, they get cracks in it. Well, OK, you get cracks in it. So what? Well, the problem with those cracks is that it, the choroid wants to make new blood vessels. It loves doing that, and if it finds a place to do that, it does. Now, the choroid's blocked by a single lamina called the retinal pigment of epithelium, and that stops the choroid from making new blood vessels, but if that gets breaks in it, just like in macular generation, these blood vessels start sprouting out, and they start causing all sorts of trouble, including bleeding and scarring in the eye. We can now do something about this a lot better than we have in the past, we have injections like Avastin and Lucentis, where we actually inject them into the eye, and that makes these shrink. These patients can also get other problems as well. Um, they can get, remember, their, their tissues are weak. So what happens when the carotid artery, which runs through the cavernous sinus, breaks? Now the artery is in direct communication with the venous system. Normally, the arteries have to go through the capillaries, which slows down the pressure nicely. The venous system is not meant to take high pressures. If you give high pressure to the venous system through a carotid cavernous fistula, which means hole, you come in looking really, really bad. Believe it or not, these can actually heal themselves. And we have patients who they actually get better on their own. But it's a pretty scary looking picture when they come in. I, um, I'm the doctor checking out the mitral prolapse, and the reason I drew the picture of the heart that way is because that's what I remember about the heart from medical school. I don't really go <laughs> below the neck much, but I'm sure it's accurate. Um, anyway, um, here are a bunch of disparate pictures, but I think let's um, have some fun with them. First, uh, for any of you who haven't, are not familiar with Disney, that's a company that makes like cartoon movies. <laughs> Anybody, Disney? No? Okay. So they had something called The Incredibles, which is like a cartoon you made. And this was Elastic Woman, and I just was wondering whether she had maybe Ellis Danlos. Um, uh, I think it's appropriate they have a hero who's elastic because, frankly, a lot of the EDS patients I've met are pretty much heroes. They get bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and law degrees and this degrees and that degrees. Like, better than other people, yet they have to overcome so much. So I'm, I'm okay calling them heroes. Patients with Ellis Danlos and can get mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse, the heart has a valve in it to keep the blood flowing in one direction, and the mitral valve is one of those valves, and it can kind of get lax and flow backwards. And it, the blood flows irregularly around this, this valve, and it can get deposits of gunk, we call vegetations. And if one of those vegetations breaks off, that person can get a stroke. These patients could also have damage to the lumina, the inside of the major vessels. Uh, this picture here depicts this patient going to have a uh, arterial dissection where the blood actually goes under one of the layers of the vessel and can effectively clog it and that can lead to stroke. Just like those other conditions. One, one thing I should mention of those whole hypercoagulable states is that most of them occur on the vein side, but some of them do occur on the arterial side, and that can lead to stroke as well. Patients with Ellis Danlos, many people don't know this, have a much higher rate of migraine. We don't know why. I have a thought as to why, but I don't know what. They have a much higher rate of migraine, and migraine patients can get complicated migraine, which is stroke. What a migraine is, is a blood vessel with muscular walls decides to contract. Constrict, contract, gets smaller. It has less blood flowing through. That can happen in all sorts of places in the body. In kids, it can happen to make them throw up. In adults, it can happen, and it can make them either see nothing, they feel like they have horse blinders on, 
or it can make them see weird things like shimmering, jagging lines that are glowing in their sides, and it's really, really cool. And they think, gee, I haven't seen this in college since I used the stuff that. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that happens, by the way, is because your brain has a, about half your brain's job is to tell the other half of your brain to not talk, to be quiet. The reason for that is you have so much stuff in your brain that if you don't have a control mechanism, you'll be thinking of things you don't want to think about. So we're talking about Ellis Danlos and Vision. You're not thinking about blue sneakers. But hey, now you're thinking about blue sneakers, but before you weren't. And that's because even though you could picture a blue sneaker in your head, you can turn it around in space, you can see the Converse label on the side. Um, you're not thinking about blue sneakers because your brain's saying, no, not now, not blue sneakers now. We're talking about Ellis Danlos. If it weren't for the portion of your brain that didn't do that, you'd see blue sneakers. Or you'd see jigging and jigging lights, which is what these patients get. Here's the connection that concerns me. A lot of work has been um, published about connections between cardiac problems like patent for Angino Valley. That's a natural hold your heart is supposed to have when you're a baby inside your mom. But when you come out, it's supposed to close. Um, or mitral valve prolapse and migraine. So there is a distinct connection between cardiac problems of the kind Ehlers-Danlos patients get and migraine. Now maybe it's, I'm not saying it's causal. I, thought I would not go so far as to say that. Maybe whatever causes the mitral valve prolapse is also somehow causing the migraine. But I just think it's pretty interesting that that connection is there. I looked through the literature to see if anyone tried to tie those two together. I could find lots of stuff on Ehlers Danlos and migraine, lots of stuff on cardiac problems and migraine and Ehlers Danlos, but nothing on connecting those three. Now we go to Ehlers Danlos in the brain. These patients can get CSF leaks, spontaneous CSF leaks. These hurt. Patients come in with this. And what happens is somewhere along their central nervous system, there's a hole and the CSF leaks and it doesn't have to be a big leak. And all of a sudden now, you, the brain is not being supported nicely in the head. <coughs> These patients get <coughs> nausea and dizziness and headache, they're miserable. <coughs> you lie them down or you put them in reverse Trendelenburg where you have the feet up and the head down and all of a sudden you give them relief. That's usually a sonoquinon that they have a CSF leak then I sent them to people like Dr. Henderson and said, please find the leak. <laughs> <laughs> However, these same patients can get elevated fluid pressure as well. Ellis Danlos patients can also get Chiari and PTC like syndromes, which is that horrible pressure on your skull. So it can go both ways. I've seen both. Probably more of the high pressure than the low. I think one of the reasons I was so pleased to be asked to come here was because I know what CSF does. My patients know what CFS does. What the Serena Maria Curiae Alliance does, lupus societies do. And they've taught me by people like you have taught me, you don't give up. And they've also taught me, you always care. So regardless of how many times your patient has been called a loony, or crazy, or it's all in your head. Well, you know, by the way, it is. Um, I remember just as an aside, uh, a parting story, a uh, young fella came to me, and he was actually applying to get to the FBI. This is about 12 years ago. And his wife accompanied him. He had hit his head, and he had double vision. We took care of him. Um, he also accidentally shot himself. It was, it was, it was, uh, he was a cop at the time. I think it was an orphan. I, was like, I didn't deal with that part, but, I, um, but his wife was just chatting with me, and she had such miserable findings. She said, why don't you come in, we'll take a look. So she made an appointment with me. Actually, I saw her. She made an appointment, and then I saw her that day. So I go up to the front and make an appointment. And she looked fine, but what she was describing, she said she's been to so many people. She had hormonal problems. She had menstrual problems. She, she was a young woman. She was trying to get pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant. It was just all over the place, just miserable. And the sweetest person you ever met. I mean, she just took it. And, and so we got an MRI. And the MRI came back as being read as normal. I like to look at the MRIs myself. You, you know, I mean, not like I'm a radiologist or anything. I, I don't, I'm, they are. I'm not. But I looked at it, and I said, and I showed her the picture. I, I said, these are low, right? And she said, what's that? And I said, the cerebellar tonsils were like 
five, six, seven millimeters descent. So I called the radiologist back up, and sure enough, they reread it and they apologized. They they weren't looking for that, so they missed that. So we sent her to um, Tom Millerat up in New York at the Chiari Center, and she also had tethered cord. But uh, it took, and all of a sudden, her life turned around. It was amazing. She can't turn very well when she wants to look at you, but uh, she's a lot happier. Anyway, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Yes. What do you think about pros for EDS? And, like when you try to get the new pros contacts and doing up in Hopkins? And what do you think? I haven't had much experience to be able to tell you. So, I mean, I, I, you know, when it comes to certain devices like contact lenses and things, I, I tend to be rather conservative. Um, I think they were invented by Satan. I'm not just, I'm just <laughs> no, just the the world of contact lenses. From my perspective, um, as being in the general eye services clinic, is I usually get the patients who are not happy. They come with a corneal ulcer, they come with no problem. I don't get the myriad of patients who are delighted with contact lenses. I get the percentage, the small percentage of them, so it's hard to say. I do know that we've yet to come up with a contact lens that doesn't cause dry eye and that doesn't be affected by dry eye. Even these lenses that are hydrogel, even though that are 95% or 97% water, we haven't come up with that. I'm kind of excited. I mean, you know, everyone laughs at me, but I, I believe that nanotechnology, like carbon nanotube kind of things, are going to be where contact lenses eventually go. I somehow believe that that's going to be able to be made because that can be thin enough to happen. I mean, this is pie in the sky right now, but people are starting to look at all the things that these amazing molecules can do. And then the other thing was, you were talking about lowering the CSF in front of your patients. What, do you always do that through a shunt or? No. Whatever. No, ways, actually. Like, um, diamond? There are a number of ways to lower First of all, Diamox and, and Neptazine are both medications that do that. They're both miserable to take. Um, they make you pee like crazy, first of all. They make you spill potassium, and they make you very shaky. They make you nauseous. They make you thirsty as anything. Um, you also can um, get feel weak with, when you're on them. Um, they, so I'm not crazy about them. They also can cause kidney stones. They also, and, and that's the bad stuff that we tell patients might cause. What they definitely will cause, you're going to take it, I tell my patients, you're going to get dysgeusia, which means when you drink Coca-Cola, it's going to taste like crap. Um, you're going to get paresthesias, which is tingling in your fingers and toes, which is going to drive you bananas. It's like electric, uh, some, way, you know, some sort of electric torture. You're going to get that on this medication. Um, so I your mouth too. So, so that's something that, that we get. Obviously, surgery is an intervention. There is one intervention that we in the ophthalmologic community have used successfully with these patients. Um, Thomas Spohr out in Michigan has the chutzpah to use it on patients if they have papilledema as well as full-blown elevated pressure and try it before offering a shunt. Most ophthalmologists say, wait a second, if they're losing vision, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll let the shunt guys do their thing first. But we have enough patients who have elevated brain pressure that we can do an optic nerve sheet fenestration. Uh, the optic nerve, as I said, is a direct extension of the brain. So if you think of, let's say, my chest is, is, the, is the brain and my jacket is the meninges, it goes all the way down the optic nerve. Let's say these are the optic nerves. So what you do, they stop somewhere short of the eyeball, and you go to that sheath, and you cut a little window in it, and out flows that CSF. And that takes pressure off the nerve. That's called an optic nerve sheet fenestration. Fenester it means window. And they have a pretty good success rate of helping the nerve. Not perfect. Um, and there are complications like any other surgery. Um, but we have a, some very good people who do those as one option for patients. And I'm, and they're gonna, I'm sure they're going to be a cadre of patients to say, would you do that for me before I get a shunt? Recognizing that shunt failure rates are not low. Um, they can be 60, 70, 80 percent, depending on the type of shunt over a 12-year period. So, and, and the shunt infection rates too. I mean, and that's in excellent hands. That's 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 part of the deal. Okay. Yes. How does nutrition affect the fluid? Like different vitamin deficiencies or um, 
mineral deficiencies or things like that? Or is there anything like that that can help with the elevated pressure? Well, a couple of things, first of all. You, know, you saw in the film about obesity. Right. And that's super important. What they don't tell you is if losing weight were really easy, yeah, everybody would do it. Think, think about it. Right. You have a patient who's in pain. You have a patient who can't turn well. You have a patient who's fragile. And now you're asking them to exercise and get out and move. And, and you're, you're asking them to potentially kill themselves. Okay? Because if they get a, a hemoarthrosis or some other problem, now they're laid up. They get a broken bone. Now they're laid up. And so they're laid up and they're depressed and they're angry. And food is comforting. And so all of a sudden, you're telling someone, I'm going to take away your only source of comfort so that you can lose weight. It's not an easy calculation. It's easy to talk about. So, but obesity is a key issue. As far as vitamins go, I always have thought about, gee, you know, what the FDA says about vitamins, that keeps changing. Perfect example is vitamin D. Vitamin D, people say, here was the amount of vitamin D you need, you take it. And they keep changing the normal values to higher and higher and higher to the point where a lot of people we didn't know are actually vitamin D deficient. I mean, I've heard, read that, you know, you work out in the sun with, you know, guys out in the sun working on a roof with his shirt off, but in 20 minutes, a half hour, he can get like 25,000 units of vitamin D his body makes, and we're telling someone to supplement, take 1,000, take 500. So, I gotta believe that nutrition is part of it. We know that vitamin C builds collagen. We know that collagen has to be strong. We know that it's not as good as we'd like it to be in patients such as Marfan. So is there a thought to maybe giving them more and see what happens? Obviously studies are gonna be needed, but the studies are needed. Yeah. Yes. I was told that I had really high eye pressure in my right eye and they told me I might be possible borderline glaucoma. But I have a lot of the symptoms, it seems like you're saying, and it seems like there may be a correlation. What do you think? If, it's, if you're saying it's a pressure issue, and would that be maybe that the guy didn't know that I'm Elder Stanlos and there's a correlation between all these things? Because um, I also have like a herniation of four millimeters, I think, of tonsil, and you know, I have had a lot of surgeries, you know, of all these things. But, you know, could it be that instead of it being a borderline glaucoma that it might be that I have this? Because, like, I have to squint because I see double and it moves, like, you know, when I have, I like, problems, I can't see with, like, unnatural light, you know, things like that. Could it be that it's not borderline glaucoma, that it's something like you're talking about? Well, you know, it's funny. You mentioned glaucoma. Just um, the question was about glaucoma and, and could there be something else going on. First thing, it's important to mention a couple of things. One. Um, glaucoma is a condition that affects the optic nerve and our best marker for glaucoma is the fluid pressure of the eyeball itself. The eye is a water-filled ball, just like the skull is, except it's called the brain too. And we can measure the pressure of the eyeball in very simple ways. When someone has glaucoma, that optic nerve starts to change. It bows outward, out pouches. The tissues surrounding the nerve wall are thinner, so we see that in high myopes, for high nearsighted people, for example. And there actually is a connection, and this was only recent, last few years, between intracranial pressure and intraocular pressure. There's a definite connection there. And that connection, there's a balance because the brain pressure is pushing the optic nerve this way and the eye pressure is pushing the optic nerve in the opposite direction. It may be, believe it or not, that high brain pressure is protective for glaucoma. We don't know yet. We do know that if the eye pressure is high, there's an elevated risk of glaucoma. And we do know that those are the patients we need to follow closely probably extra closely because since we know the high brain pressure can cause damage to the visual parts of the brain and cause visual field defects, just like glaucoma can cause visual de field defects from different reasons. When we look at a patient, we check them with something called a visual field and we do a test called an OCT, which is actually a special photograph made with laser of the optic nerve looking at its thickness. We look to see, hey, does this nerve look like a glaucoma nerve? Does this nerve look like a 
nerve that's okay if the visual field is disproportionately bad. We have a pretty remarkable glaucoma team at Wilmer. Uh, Harry Quigley is considered probably one of the best in the country. I, I think he's the best personally, but many people think he's certainly one of the best. And, and so I tend to work with him when I have a patient where we have these kind of problems. And uh, that's generally, you know, I, I help even make arrangements for these patients to see him because it's just too tricky an area. Okay, to tell the difference. You it mean? can be tricky. Okay. It can be tricky. I think that ultimately we would look at a patient's eye pressure. We look at their corneal thickness, which is another indicator. Thin corneas have a higher risk of glaucoma. We look at their visual field. We look at their OCT, and we look at this picture together and say, "Okay, is this glaucoma or not?" If it is, we talk to a patient and say, "Listen, this we think this is glaucoma." Unfortunately, when all you have is a hammer, you treat every problem like a nail. Yeah. So we treat so glaucoma. The only hammer we have is lowering the eye pressure, and that's probably the thing something that we, we discuss with a patient. And there are numbers of surgery, laser, and drops that do that. Yes. I could probably keep you busy for an hour, but I promise not to. I don't mind. If, long, if I don't, as long as no one's on me. With Chiari and EDS, is it typical to have vision changes almost daily? Yeah. And if so, is that okay? What are some warning indicators that you would give for people to look out for? Okay. The answer is yes, and the answer is sometimes to the second question. One of the things I've seen in my brain injury patients, and remember that Chiari is a brain injury-like condition, if you think about it. These patients have problems with eye teaming, and depending on the day, maybe depending on the atmospheric pressure as well, they can have problems using their eyes as a team. When you and I look out at infinity, our eyes should be essentially parallel. Anything close to the infinity, our eyes have to converge. So when you look at something up close, the eyes seem to almost look like they're crossing. That ability to converge is exquisitely delicate. And your ability to converge fluctuates depending on how tired you are, how interested the subject is, but also it can fluctuate based on other problems. I, in my brain injury patients, I see this all the time, and their biggest complaint they come in is, I can't read. I just can't read. And I went for my, they come up with a bag of glasses. Okay, I can't. And they're not just dollar store glasses, but some of them. And I say, well, tell me about it. Okay, so I can't read, so I went to my eye doctor and he gave me a stronger pair of reading glasses. And I held things closer and it was so clear, but then I couldn't read it after a while. And then I got a headache. Convergence insufficiency means your eyes can't come together well. Stronger reading glasses means you have to hold things closer and it magnifies them. So now you're actually fighting yourself. And these patients come to me miserable. And if you don't look for it, because the eye looks fine, I mean, it's white, it's quiet, and it's beautiful, you don't see it. And so this is one of the things, I, when I gave a talk actually down, not, not far from BWI, the um, uh, Maryland Optometric Association, the talk I gave there was TBI, rehab, and vision. And there are so many things that if you know to look for them, and it's really just a couple of simple things, having them follow a pendulum and watching them vomit because they can't do that, mm -hmm. or having them uh, ch testing their convergence and watching them hit you because it hurts, you get a sense of what to ask these patients. So the answer is it's possible. That's just one example of the things I get. Another thing is patients' ability to accommodate, which means focus their natural lenses. We all can accommodate a lot when we're little, by the time we hit 40 ish or so, not so much. By the time we hit 65, not really at all. But our ability to accommodate is also based on our, what's called sympathetic and, and cholinergic tone, the tone of the autonomic nervous system. And if that tone changes because we're screwing around with the brain stem, then, or we're screwing around with the, with the brain, then who knows what's that going to do to our focusing mechanism. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have a question and I had a comment. So I know you're talking about weight. Um, I just want to just share something. If I, I don't care about people and how much I weigh. If I carry weight about 150, my carry headaches are very manageable without medication. If I go up to 158, I want to be cut open. 
So for me, and so maybe for other people who think, oh, I have to lose 20 pounds to make a difference, they may not have to. It may be as little as six to eight pounds. You're exactly right. When we get patients with pseudotuma cerebri, large studies have shown they don't have to lose 100 pounds. They have to lose about 15% of BMI, body mass index. And for some people, that can be as little as 10, 5, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, certainly. We don't know why that is. It's interesting, in the osteopathic literature, I don't poo-poo anything. I'll use voodoo if it works. Okay? I mean, I, okay. So, but in the osteopathic literature, they talk about something called the craniosacral pump. And they discuss how this craniosacral pump is intimately related to brain pressure. And that patients with obesity, depending on whether it's trunkal obesity, axial, or whether it's limbal obesity, can have different effects on it. And I had a patient, remember I worked in Lancaster, a lot of Amish up there. Um, they used to always look at me, by the way, when I was mowing my own lawn, because first of all, I'm a guy mowing the lawn. Usually the women mow the lawn up there. The guys ride the tractors. So there are these women with like Clydesdales pushing these uh, lawn mowers. Uh, strong as I, they come in like cute hands and they're amazing, strong. And, and, and they used to look at me because I had a straw hat, but I had a mustache. And so Amish guys don't have mustaches, they got the straw hat. And I remember one patient actually asked me, like, you know, are you Amish? In and, and like, kind of a Dutchy accent. And I said, yeah. He said, but you're wearing a mustache. And I said, I'm reformed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so the guy came in, and, and, and he came in, and he didn't want surgery of any kind. And his pressure was high. And so a, a, a osteopathic physician I knew said, let me take a look at him. She manipulated him. And when he came back, the pulsations of his vein at the back of the optic nerve, which are supposed to spontaneously pulsate, were not pulsating when I first saw him and were pulsating the second time I saw him. And the second time I saw him, he said his symptoms were all better. That's all I know. Something happened. He didn't lose weight. The guy was skinny as a rail. I don't know. But I do know that, you know, there's a lot we don't know. And so we have to keep an open mind, which is why when you get a patient with Chiari symptoms, it goes to a doctor, and they have a list of complaints this long, and oftentimes, unfortunately, if let's say they're a gal, oh, it's like, you know, God forbid, because women unfortunately still get, in my opinion, poor treatment than men do when they're sitting in the chair. I've seen it. And so they come in and she's a complainer. And it's like, no, no, really listen. You can t I can't tie all that together, but you can't tie it together, but it can be tied together if you ask the right question. And you said you also had a comment? Or? Oh, then I actually had a question. So I've been dealing with dry for a while, for about a year. It's really bad. And now I'm going to come see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we have dry specialists too, by the way. I mean, because my regular eye doctor wanted to put plugs in my eyes, and I just think that's counterintuitive for an ALS Downs patient if you have lax. Why would you plug well, okay, let me just well, just to give a little some background here. Patients with dry eye, dry eye is like weight gain. It's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Once a person has dry eye, the eyelids, the tear producing cells become inflamed, and they start making really kind of a toxic tear film. And that toxic tear film then irritates the eye worse, and you get drier eye. If I would, we can plug up the natural tear drains in the eye using something called puncta plugs. The little drains are little holes called the puncta. It means point. And the tears naturally drain. They actually drain into the nose. And then that's why sometimes if you take an eye drop or you cry, you can taste your tears in the back of your throat. We can plug those drains. And there certainly will be more fluid on the eye. But if it's a toxic witch's brew, do you really want that bathing in your eye? What we do with these patients now, at least what I do with my patients now, is if moisturization doesn't work, I'll first want to make the tear film healthier. Healthier in quantity and healthier in quality. I've had a lot of good results with restasis, for example. That's topical cyclosporin. It's an, anti, it's an immune modulating agent. It's not a steroid. I don't like using steroids in the eye. I can avoid it. Lots of problems with that, uh, especially in long-term use. And I've had pretty good results with Restasis, and once I get the tear from healthier, then maybe I can talk about plugs. But a lot of patients don't need those plugs once you get the tear from healthier. Just a little extra ophthalmology: the tear from actually has three layers. It's hard for that; it looks like water, but it's actually three layers. The top, the layer closest to the eye is made of mucus. That, that 
It's a wetting agent to keep the tears on your eyeball in the first place. The largest layer is water, which has vitamin C and lysosine, all sorts of goodies in it. And the very top layer is oil, which actually keeps things smooth, allows good lubrication, and keeps things from evaporating. Patients can have any one of these as a problem. And so you, when you first diagnose someone with dry eye, the first thing you want to find is what layer is deficient. Maybe all of them are deficient. But the restasis certainly helps reduce the inflammation. Those patients who also have, let's say, problems producing lipid, so the oil layer is not good. Well, then there's other things we can do for them. There's a drop called azocyte, which even though it's an antibiotic, one of its side effects, like doxycycline is an antibiotic, but one of its side effects, same side effect, is it makes the lipids in the eyes flow better, and they get much healthier tear films. So there's a lot you do to manipulate the tear film before you put plugs in, at least, or my team. I mean, Dr. like I said, SN ACPEC, for example, at, at uh, Hopkins is considered one of the best in the field. Do we have time for any more questions? Or do I, I've yeah. gone on too long, I apologize. No, I, I think this is, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard such a great I have a medical student from Canada back here, <laughs> and I've explained that to all of my patients that he's from Canada. Um, he's actually super bright, but but I think he describes uh, working with me as like being at Marine Corps boot camp. But I, I, I would love to be a student under you. I think your teaching is just tremendous. I've learned so much. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you talked about uh, the EDS patients being heroes and heroines, and um, and we heard from one heroine, and, and we have another one back here, and, and that's uh, Brooklyn Courtney Mills. I call her Courtney because that's a southern name. Uh, and Courtney and Rebecca are just down here from Canada. They drove in yesterday afternoon. And oh, Courtney, can you come up? And Courtney was... I asked Courtney, um, this is really like public speaking, but I asked her to share her story uh, with you all. But when she was uh, 14, her, her cheerleading team in Canada decided to compete in the North American cheerleading competition. And how many teams uh, tried for that? Well, there was only one Canadian team, but then the 14 teams. But there's... 14 were sort of competed to get there. I mean, it was a highly selected group of teams <laughs> for the national champions. And and they made it to the semifinals. And, and and one of Courtney's tricks was to do backward handstands about five times across the stage. <laughs> and being the most athletic member of the team, she was also the one that would go to the top of the pyramid, which is one of the, you know, acts. And uh, when they made it to the semi, they, they won the semifinals to go to the finals. And at that point, uh, an ambulance had to take Courtney to, to the hospital. And so she was in, uh, had IVs and was getting pain medicine and, and whatever they did for EDS in those days. And, um, and, they, and, and so they were scheduled to be heading to the finals. Um, and, and Courtney realized that, the, that they were not going to be able to train anyone to, to do what she did in, in, two day, in one or two days. And, and so on the evening of the event, she, she pulled out her IVs and, <laughs> and caught a cab down to the, <laughs> to the stadium where they had this, um, this, these finals and competed, and they won. So, so we have a national cheerleading champion here, <laughs> and then immediately afterwards she collapsed, and the ambulance had to take her back. <laughs> but uh, anyway, she's a straight A student, you know, top in math. Wants to get a PhD in mathematics, and um, and uh, I think she'll be absolutely brilliant and a huge um, have a huge effect on, on all the people. Uh, she already has a huge effect on all the people around her. But if, if you could just say, if you make, tell them your story a little bit, uh, with special reference to the visual issues. All right, Courtney. Yeah. Well, um, well, it started off a couple of years ago. 
then I started getting symptoms here and there and I just kind of brushed them off for a while until about four years ago when symptoms started getting really bad. I started getting more of them, which started as there was a lot of stomach issues and there were, I started getting numbness down my left arm. I started getting pain down both my legs, down in my back. And I started losing vision in my left eye. Um, and that was just, that came on slowly. It was just one day, it was a little blurry. And um, about a week later, I called my mom in class and I said, I cannot see whatsoever in my left eye. And we, by that point, we just started seeing a few doctors and then more symptoms started happening. I started getting constant migraines and um, I got to a point where I was, it, everything just started crippling me and so I ended up in a wheelchair and I had to be taken out of school and um, I was in a hospital bed in my living room and it got to a point where I, I didn't have any quality of life. I couldn't function, I couldn't really do anything what a normal teenager is supposed to do and each symptom started getting worse and worse and um, I knew at that point I couldn't just lay here and just let things progress and so by that point I was completely blind in the left eye. I had constant migraine that never went away. I had pain that was constant and continued to get worse each day and that's when and we've, we saw um, hundreds of doctors in Canada and no one could tell us what was wrong. And that's when we came down to the States. And after we got a bunch of diagnoses, I had a bunch of surgeries afterwards. And that concluded a, I had the um, cervical decompression infusion. And um, that actually ended up giving most of my vision back after that surgery and it gave back feeling in my arms and some of the feeling back in my legs. The telecord took away pain down my legs. There were the shunt took away. I was throwing up. I wasn't able to eat for over eight months by that point. I was on a feeding tube and after and no one could tell me why and after the LP shunt was put in. I stopped throwing up. I stopped. I wasn't nauseous anymore. And so each surgery brought back something, one of the symptoms that had me in that crippled state. And each surgery just kind of it kept pushing me further and further to the point where I was up and up <coughs> again. I had a life back again, and then. Um, a few months later, there was a few setbacks, and I started having seizures, and in August, they weren't able to stop the seizures, so I was put into a medically induced coma in Canada for a week, and they couldn't tell me why I was having them, and they couldn't explain the reasoning for them, and so they just... They didn't look quite really into it and they just sort of sent me home the way I was saying maybe this is just how she's going to be and we didn't again we didn't accept that answer and so we came back down and found out I did have um, a clotting disorder and once I was put on the blood thinners the seizures completely stopped and I haven't had any since and so there have been many things that before I came here, I was in a wheelchair permanently. I hadn't walked in over a year and a half, and I had absolutely no quality of life. I, I couldn't go to school, I couldn't see friends, I couldn't <coughs> do anything, I couldn't go to the washroom on my own, all things that everyone should be able to do. And now I'm standing here and I have started school back up again. I'm finishing everything that I wasn't able to before. And I'm I'm happy now. I've I've gotten through so many things and it hasn't it hasn't stopped me in any way. I'm still it if anything it has motivated me more to do things that I love and it has made me 
ex pretty much see things I wasn't able to before and be able to challenge myself in ways I never thought I could. And so the more things I keep getting pushed through, it adds more, more kind of, more push to do, to do bigger things. And so it, it really has, it's changed my life, but it has changed my life in a very good way. And it's made me see things in a completely different point of view. And so that point, I, I think so far, I think I, I, this is the best I've been in over four years. And um, I'm quite proud to be in this place right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Someone who doesn't do public speaking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and by the way, uh, the mothers of children with EDS are the finest people in the world. And their dads. Okay. Uh, next next meeting is going to be in three months. And by the way, I'm very pleased we had um, a lot of. Uh, top doctors showing up like Dr. Kobe and Dr. Wong and Dr. Lee and Dr. Frank Romano and um, the, I think I missed someone back there, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Brigamonte from Johns Hopkins was very, I uh, wanted to be here and just kind of try to make it, because we might get him to talk about shunts. Uh, the the lumboperitoneal shunts, by the way, uh, and the literature don't even last a year. I mean, they, uh, but they, we don't like to put them in the brain because it causes slip ventricle syndrome. But anyway, uh, that was a superb, phenomenal talk. Thank you so much, and see you all in three minutes.